Welcome, everyone. Uh, Sunday, September the 2nd, 2018. Labor Day long weekend. The start of the sept, uh, the start of September. It's back to everything. It's the fall season is coming. We still have summer, uh, but it's back to school. It's back to work and it's back to Hockey, and this is, of course, the Hockey Podcast. I am Kevin Olenek. You can follow me, Spreaker.com, KVOLE, SoundCloud, KVOLE, YouTube, KVOLE. Uh, we may have some news on iTunes here. It looks like you can find my podcast on iTunes, so check that out uh, as well. Podcasts, for different podcasts. And joining me today is Sean Beardy Canuck. How, have your, how has your summer been? Gone well, and looking forward to get back to actually seeing some some hockey now. It, yes, it feels kind of like everything is starting to begin again. We're starting to, yeah, it's starting to get uh, back into the groove. It's that mix of like uh, boo and yay at the same time, uh, and you know, it was quite. An off season. This was probably one of the more adventurous off seasons in a long time. Of course, especially here in the Vancouver Canuck land, where in the middle of July or the end of July, you have a the release of Trevor Linden as president of the club, and apparently going in a brand new direction with someone. Right now, Jim Benning. Uh, we talked a lot about that. Uh, we talked a lot about, of course, the signings of Beagle and the signings of uh, Roussel and the signings of all of that. We talked about the kids of Quinn Hughes and the, the draft. And we're here at now the uh, approaching the Young Stars, one of the great tournaments that is out there. Unfortunately, this year, Left out by the Flames and the Oilers, not being a part of this, but of course the Young Stars Classic in Penticton. One of the big storylines with the Canucks this year. What are you looking forward to? And really, a couple of other things. What's kind of your been your takeaways for the last little month now that it is the Lindenless Canucks? What are you feeling? Anything you need to get off your chest or about that, or it's done and we're ready to move on. Uh, yeah, I think it's done. We're ready to move on and, uh, we just need to look forward. The, uh, the Canucks look to be sort of in the basement, but that just, uh, should help the rebuild and get, uh, Jack Hughes, uh, into the fold, hopefully. But, uh, when, but that's always such a, uh, uh, just a little, like I said, it's a lottery, so you can't read really, the Canucks can't really look at, uh, at that as a full and and hope for that. Even fans of Tank Nation and all that need to just remember to temper their expectations on that. But uh, just looking forward and, and selling, the Canucks need to be looking at how they can sell hope, sell the Brock Besters, sell the Bo Horvats, sell the Elias Pettersons, and uh, go from there. You know, one thing that did make the news the last little bit, I, I guess we should talk a little bit about this as well, just to realize this. Elliot Friedman has found a way to stir up Canucks Nation this summer as well. And he did that again by tweeting out that the Canucks inquired about Eric Carlson. Did you, yeah, what, I think that was uh, a little bit more of a... Uh, Elliot, Elliot knows what uh, what buttons to push, despite uh, him saying otherwise. But uh, I don't put uh, don't say think of anything bad of the Canucks sticking the tires on Eric Carlson, seeing what it would take to get him. But the fact is, I don't think they were ever seriously in there, and that's just something that uh, Elliot never said. But uh, Canucks uh, Canucks Nation took uh, took to the next level, as they always seem to do. Yes, they they. They did. There was some always. It's it's just fascinating how it just kind of it snaps in that way, shape, or form. But I'm with you. I didn't think it was that big of an issue. It 
I bet you 32 teams called about Eric Carlson. If, if You are not doing your job as a general manager if you're not calling about a guy like Eric Carlson. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, into him a little bit later about that from a, from a league-wide perspective. But in terms of the young stars, what are you excited about here? What are you hoping that comes out of the young stars part heading into Canucks' regular training camp? Well, I think uh, as... The same with many, many all Canucks fans. Uh, Elias Pettersson needs to show well in, in the Young Stars and push and make it basically a, a, a no contest on whether or not he's going to make the, the roster or not. And then I'm also looking forward to seeing how um, Jonathan Dolan looks w- alongside Elias Pettersson because um, one of my sort of bold predictions going into this season is uh, that uh, Jonathan Dolan's going to surprise a lot of people and will be on the Canucks everyday roster by Christmas or just around there. Really? You think you think he's you think he's yeah. got a shot to be on the team? Yeah, it's- I like his. Uh, I I just think that his skating uh, fits real well with uh, Travis Green's system, and he has shown the willingness to play basically a a 200 foot game while still uh, not being afraid to push the pace uh, offensively and be creative. He would be a very good add to the, what is a uh, very much a, a changing of the guard. Now that the, the Sedins are gone and adding, uh, adding his speed, his creativity in the, in the offense, I think is something that Canucks need desperately. And I, as I said, I just, you look at how he plays and um, how he just uh, isn't isn't uh, isn't afraid to to go to play a very um, aggressive game, both offensively and go, coming back defensively. That's going to play really well with Travis Green, and I think it's if he doesn't make it out of camp, I it's going to be tough to keep him in Utica. Just like sort of how they uh, treated uh, Nikolai Goldobin last year. Hmm. Hmm. So going through, yes. Yeah, so Dolan will be there. Elias Pettersson will be there. Adam Goddat will be there. Yona Gadjevich, um, Nando Egenberger, Reed Gardner, Owen Hardy, Lucas Jasek, Cole Lynn, Zach McEwen, Tyler Tanner, McC- Tanner McMaster, Isaac Nurse, Petrus Palmu, Anthony Salantri will be the forwards. Defensively, you got Jacob Brahani, Gleam Brisebois, Kalen Bullich, Jalen Chatfield, Jaeger Dirk, Oli Yolevi. I think Jaeger Dirk is my favorite name of all of these of the prospects. Uh, Garrett McFadden, Jet Wu, and then the goaltenders, Michael DiPietro and e- Ivan Kolbakov. That, that tournament will run September 7th to 9th in Penticton. Just as a side note, I don't see the Winnipeg Jets have released that roster yet. Uh, what about Oli Yolevi? What are you... What has to happen here? This is a guy that um, I think some still some pretty high hopes and expectations here, uh, especially with Quinn Hughes not g- going to be in camp. I think some people are hoping that Yolevi shows well. Oh yeah, he has he he needs to show well. Um, but for me, he doesn't necessarily need to make the Canucks out of camp. But he needs to play well enough down in Utica if he doesn't to push um, the Canucks into trading off one of their veterans uh, and making room for him. So it's just it, the, the, uh, the young stars in Penticton is just, just as the start of what uh, should be, uh, it will, will be a uh, most likely career ch- uh, defining season for um, Hulevi. Cause if he doesn't, uh, show well and struggles throughout uh, this upcoming season, it's going to be tough for him to do much of anything with, uh, with the Canucks going forward. Uh, just with the fan base, probably going to be souring on him and, uh, and just uh, not to he, the pressure just continuing to mount. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, this is a really important time uh, for him. I, uh, of course, a couple of other people, I think, Petrus Palmu showed well at the Prospects game in, or earlier in the summer, so I think a lot of people are really excited about him. Uh, and I think it's going... Michael DiPietro, 
I think it's a really interesting opportunity in front of him. He's got this this young stars camp. Not only that, he's got the World Juniors in, in the backyard at Rogers and in Victoria and Vancouver to show the Canuck fans what the potential could be long term for him. So it's a really neat opportunity for Michael DiPietro, I think, to introduce yeah. himself to the Canuck fans. He's base. got uh, he's got quite uh, he's got a very similar um, sort of junior opportunity as uh, as uh, Luke Bordon and Corey Schneider did uh, back when we look back at uh, promising Canucks prospects. Both of them got to play in front of uh, the, uh, the, Van- the in Vancouver in the World Juniors. So um, Di Pietro's got, got the potential to, to sort of throw a wrench into the Canucks uh, goaltending uh, future plans, even though Demko is looking really good. Di Pietro, just everything he says, uh, ev- just he comes across as someone who has – for lack of a better term, the it factor to uh, just to to take it to the next level and always f- and looking for that the the next way to get better. Yeah. So um, it's very it'll be very interesting to see uh, how he does in camp. But uh, as you, I don't think anyone should be expecting anything other than just a, a strong showing in camp and then going back to the OHL and. Uh, and going from there, uh, he I don't think he'll uh, he'll finish the season in Windsor. Uh, they're supposedly in a bit of a rebuild in the OHL, and I think by uh, by World Juniors time, he sh- he'll be uh, traded to a more of a contender in the Ontario Hockey League. Yeah, yeah. So big opportunity for him. Now, uh, as mentioned, of course, Calgary and Edmonton is always is a part of this, but. I'm, for a, probably a number of myriad of different reasons, Edmonton going to Europe at the start of the regular season, the Flames training camp in China, uh, they are not going to be at this Classic. Also, I think Brian Burke had some things to say about that as well. Uh, does this diminish the tournament for you, or how do you how do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, it, would, it diminishes it a little bit, but in, in terms of what the... Uh, idea of this the, the tournament is I it doesn't really change it too much because all you're doing is it's basically rookie camp so the uh, both the Canucks and the Jets can see live fire um, game situations um, against uh, non uh, against players who aren't in the organization so you don't have to be too worried about uh, um friendly fire so it, like people are uh, the the players are going to go full bore and it's still it's still fun to watch it's just uh, unfortunate that uh due to situations and then maybe uh the the flames and oilers wanting to maybe try and do a uh and i believe they are doing a can- uh, something similar in red deer uh for this season just uh, it's a uh, just a little bit of a different situation though yeah, I just I am kind of sad about that. I think I think to me, I think having this the West the four teams in the West, although Winnipeg is it's a weird West, but Winnipeg is West. But the four teams in the West, uh, I think getting involved in that I think will is is great because uh, it gets the fan bases excited. I mean, maybe you want to switch it from Penticton to Red Deer every once in a while, but I can't blame Penticton for not having it. What I could see, though, in the future is this future Seattle team could jump in on this as well. I don't think that that would be a hurtful thing for Seattle at all, uh, to have that prospect camp come up in Penticton. or Even a couple of California teams jump up in there as well. I wouldn't mind seeing that. I think it would create a different dynamic a little bit, but... These types of things are great, and I mean, Penticton has always done a great job, and I think it's great for the prospects to do that. I, it's as a Flames perspective, it's going to sound really weird for me to say it this way, but the Flames and Oilers are almost tired in a lot of ways. Like that's just it. It's an old rival that I think just people. It hasn't mattered in the Flames Oilers rivalry hasn't truly mattered. In about almost, we're getting close to thirty years now, Sean. Where that that rivalry has truly mattered to any significance, that we need yeah, to keep going. The, uh, the with there's no uh, with no playoff series to really jumpstart it and get it to uh, the level of what if you 
what they what it could be, and that's what uh, the Detroit uh, Colorado back in nineties. We can even throw in probably a new age one of uh, Canucks and, and Hawks. That's what the that's what the Battle of Alberta should be. Yeah, two teams that absolutely hate each other and are playing and are competitive and are playing against each other almost too many times because they're playing in potentially playoff series and all that. Canucks and Flames have done that a, lot, a little bit and gotten there's been heat from that. While the Flames and Oilers have, haven't seen each other in the playoffs since what was it late eighties, early nineties, nineteen ninety two. Yep. Okay. But yeah, that's that's what that's what jumpstarts rivalries now. It's not necessarily the there, yeah. There's a little bit of geographic in that, but what jumps jumpstarts it to the next level to the point where it becomes memorable for uh, outside of a generation is is playoffs yeah so sure. you just the, without the playoff without that happening it's it's tough to see that uh that doing a, that uh that rivalry getting to the level that it should be at yeah yeah it's not yeah and it's not with a preseason game with prospects for sure i, I just i i, I don't know i it's just it's it's it that's one of the weird things that Brian Burke kind of left as a as a legacy with the Flames. We'll get into the Flames in just a little bit here. Uh, uh, here, I, I think a couple of – to do the Canuck training camp storyline, there was a lot of conversation on Canuck Radio this week about if the Canucks need a captain, is it Bo Horvat, is it Brock Besser, or do we wait? Where are you on this? Uh, wait. You go into this season with you naming – couple of the sort of the veterans, the good Bransons, the Del Zottos, the Tanevs, and then you throw in the uh, a Horvat and and maybe another young younger player, maybe a Stetcher, maybe you even throw a Brock in there, but you don't you don't put a you don't put a C on on anyone until they step up. There is a it's tough for despite them being sort of quieter play players and people, the Sidians were just big personalities in that room and it's it's tough to really see what the dynamic will be in the in the dressing room until they're gone and and that's not gonna, that's not gonna play itself out until uh at least halfway through this season so there's no rush to naming a captain in my opinion and uh if it happens to be um Bo Horvat, like I think it will be that's great if it happens to be someone else then they probably deserve it more because they they out uh, they outshone uh, someone who looks to be very much captain material in Bo Horvat. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a wait. I think you have to to wait. I don't think uh, I I don't think that this, there's anyone there that I mean it's probably going to be Bo Horvat at some point in time. I will agree with you on that, but I I just I don't think you need you need to do that right now. I think you just need to let this team develop into its new era, whatever this looks like, um, and let, you know, let that happen, whatever that is. If it's Horvat, if it's Besser, if you're, and you're saying if it's anyone else, uh, let's just see where this team goes before we put that C on on anyone. I I, I mean, I wonder if, if a lot of teams are going to start going with the non-captain route. I mean, we're already seeing that in Toronto a little bit with the Matthews Tavares argument of who should be captain. It, 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 it becomes a dangerous distraction, but we'll, we'll see about that. I think, I think waiting probably is the winner there, but you know, uh, what about yeah, it just, uh, it makes too much sense to me because they, yeah, with the, the Leafs, um, they had the same thing with Matt Sundin leaving just, such a such a leadership void going in there, right? And then you've got you look at up at, with Edmonton and the Oilers. They they tried to do a stopgap with like an Andrew Ference, but is that really better than just uh, going with a bunch of uh, like more of a leadership core and a bunch of alternate captains? I don't I don't think so. Yeah, I I agree. And uh, of course, as we head into training camp as well, a couple of other storylines. I think it will be interesting. Uh, I think I'm going to be very curious how Beagle and Roussel specifically deal with this training camp. 
Uh, I think the fans have unfortunately given him a, the evil eye because of the contracts that they have. Uh, so I feel like there's some undue pressure on them. Do you agree with that? Or Yeah, I, I definitely think that there is uh, some un, some undue pressure on both those guys. I think more Beagle than Roussel. I think Roussel will um, eva- like will be some of, uh, somewhat of a uh, under the radar fan favorite come mid mid to late season. Everyone will go, oh, I don't like his contract, but I do like him as a player. But uh, I think uh, Jay Beagle will have uh, a little bit harder of uh, a time to get get to that point because of uh, his age and uh, the fact that he's. Uh, um, more in a in a prominent role because I think uh, they'll probably use him as more of a shutdown guy like they had with, with Sutter this past season. Yeah. Uh, who needs to have a really good camp from a veteran perspective? I got a couple names I want to hear if, if we're going to be on the same page. I uh, well, I don't think you can really call him a veteran, but uh, Nikolai Goldobin definitely needs a a really good camp. Otherwise he could see himself being wave traded or back in Utica. Um, even an Alex Biega, as well, as much as he, we, we like him as a six, seven defenseman. He's going to be in tough with, uh, with, um, Hugh Levy coming up as well. Uh, and then, uh, and Ben Hutton as well. He needs to have a good, uh, good camp. He was not in, uh, Travis Green's, uh, good books last year. And he, uh, Needs to come in looking and showing that he's in shape and uh, playing to the potential he had a couple years ago under Willie Desjardins. Yeah, yeah, those guys too. A couple of other guys. I'm, uh, I'm want to throw Jacob Markstrom in there because I think I think this guy needs to if he's going to be the number one goalie for this year. I think he needs to build some sort of confidence around this team. I mean, yeah, the expectations are, are, are slim to none right now. But if you do have a goaltender, then at least you have some sort of confidence going in. So I think he needs to have a good camp uh, and not have this the Demko, at least with a guy like Demko, that you're not necessarily feeling that you have to throw him in sooner than he needs to. I mean, he may or may not be ready. We'll We'll see. Uh, and I think Mr. Sven Barchi needs to have a really good camp. This is a guy that I think, uh, I feel like we're almost at a career turner for him. Like he, he is a guy that got married this year. Congratulations to that. But this is a guy that, that needs, I don't want to say that he needs to be, he's a top six forward. He needs to start playing like he's the top six forward. He's going to be on the number one line, probably with Horvat and Besser. I think that that's expected. And I do think they need some production from him this year. Yeah, I think he definitely is penciled in on that number one line right now, but he, there's definitely a couple, couple guys who are going to be chomping at the bit to try and take that spot from him. Actually, I would say a few guys. You've got uh, Nikolai Goldovan and, and Brendan Leipzig, both who got a shot after Berchi was injured um, to fill that uh, fill that spot. As and then uh, even uh, a Jake Vertanen who yep. wants to make it make uh, make the Canucks top six and not be more of a and, and be a more prominent player. So it's the. Competition is great. That's the one thing that the Canucks have going for them this year, because the uh, outside of the the Brock Bessers, the uh, Bo Horvats, they don't really have anyone who has proven that they can uh, score at the uh, NHL level. They've got a lot of hope and promise, but no one who's actually done it uh, consistently enough in the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah. And Jake, you're right about Jake Fortana. I think he needs to have a really good camp as well. Um, I just at least not to the point that he needs to be in star, but I think I think fans would at least like to see progress from Jake Furtanen. At least, yeah, he's. Uh, I think he's. I think uh, Travis Green really likes what uh, uh, Vertanen brings when he's on his game. He just he just he can, can continues to preach the consistency part, and if if he can get that, then I. Definitely see uh, him 
pushing up the the lineup and being more of a prominent player and hopefully uh, starting to produce like the uh, like you would want from a uh, top 10 uh, draft pick. Yeah. 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 So big year for them. Training camp coming up for the Canucks going to be very, very interesting. Uh, let's switch to the Flames here for a moment. Uh, Noah Hannafin fi- finally signed a six-year deal, $24 million. Uh, of course, part of that big trade in the offseason. The Flames had an, also a very interesting offseason, not as nationally recognized, not as as earth-shattering nationally, but uh, they made the, the big trade at the draft, getting Lindholm and Hannafin uh, for Furland, Dougie Hamilton, and uh, Adam Fox. They got a new, new coach this year, Bill Peters. Uh, brought in a new it's got an associate coach, including Jeff Ward. Glenn Gullickson is out. A uh, bunch of people. James Neal signed here as a, as a free agent. Troy Brower was bought out now in Florida. I don't know. I don't know, Sean. This is where I'm kind of... There has been a lot of change in Calgary, no question. And I and has the change necessary? Yes, absolutely. I think there needed to be something different in this Flames dressing room. My question or my wonder is: I don't know if this team is better. I don't know where this. I don't, I, I mean, I think the team is different, but I don't know if the team is better. I think that's a, a good way of putting it. There's, uh, I think there's a lot more potential to be better um, with adding the skill of uh, Lindholm up front. He should be a little more consistent than uh, than Furland, who had a great first half of the season and then just tailed off really, really badly on the uh, on the score sheet in the second half. Um, Hannafin should be a little more steady than, than Dougie Hamilton, but he de- definitely won't be as uh, dynamic offensively. So that's another sort of trade-off you can look at and say whether or not that's good or bad. And then um, I have mentioned this multiple times on, on the podcasts I've been on here with you. So I'm not necessarily sold on Bill Peters as a coach. Um, I don't, uh, everything that I've heard in terms of the people who sort of delve into systems and, and how those systems, uh, help, uh, teams, uh, succeed, uh, his system's going to need a lot of tweaking to be successful, I think. And whether or not he can do that is, uh, definitely up in the air. Yeah. I, and I, I, I don't know what to make of that either. He's, he has talked a very good game. Uh, he said some really insightful things, but his stats are not backing that up. And I don't know if that was player wise. And then you got two Carol, but you got two Carolina Hurricanes that came with him and Hannafin and Lindholm. And I mean, I think in terms of flexibility, there's a lot more options in terms of the forward. Uh, I think there's a lot more competition now too. Uh, but there's some guys that I, you know, I I will argue that there are some flames players that really need to have a big camp. Sam Bennett needs to have a big camp. It's, you know, I've been kind of behind him a little bit, but it's, it's time for him to start making another step. This guy's taken far too many penalties. Like just like, it's ridiculous. Like the area there, every time he's on the ice, almost there's been penalties. Like I'm exaggerating in some senses, but it's, it's partly true. Uh, I'm also cynical about TJ Brody going back to the right side with Giordano. This has been two straight years of this. I'm not sure if it's just because he's been on the left side that he's struggled. I, I'm wondering if there's something else. Uh, in terms of goaltending, which Mike Smith are we going to get? Are we going to get the healthy Mike Smith? Or are we going to get the after? the? I came back to early Mike Smith. Just, it feels a bit like, like this camp needs to be... And these kids didn't do this as much last year in the training camp. This year, these kids, the kids, the prospects really need to step up and have a good camp. But I just feel right now like it's just, I don't know. I don't know what to expect from this team. Yeah, despite the uh, the changes coming in with uh, Hannafin on the blue line and, and Lindholm up, up front, 
the roster still to me for the most part seems very stale and I'm not sure whether whether or not those two additions plus the plus the change in coach is going to be good enough to get them into the playoffs and become that contender that uh, you would you could you could have said they would have been a couple years ago when they acquired Hominick and you looked at that blue line saying it's probably one of the best on paper. Yeah, um, it, but it, as they showed, it just it didn't work. So I, it's it's tough because you yeah you, the, for me I think the the Flames need to see um, one of Valimaki, Anderson or or Shillington step up and and become. Uh, uh, an everyday player with on the on that blue line for me to say that they're 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 moving in the right direction. Yeah, I I agree, I agree. I mean, and I think Brett Kulak got a wake up call when he was went on waivers and no one picked him up. It was part of the uh, arbitration. I think there's some good wake up calls there. I also forgot about Derek Ryan, another former Carolina Hurricane that's going to be on the team too. I forgot about that. Uh, and I think there's going to be. I think James Neal is going to go through some Troy Brower treatment, Sean. If he doesn't produce, they're going to be looking at that contract and going, what is going on with James Neal? Yeah, he definitely needs to show. Uh, well, the thing with James Neal, though, despite the contract being a little more, little too long for what it should be, uh, he's definitely proven that he, he's at least a 25 to 30 goal scorer consistently. So I don't think that's going to be as big an issue. My thing is the, is more the blue line as well as the, the the third the third line, whether or not that that line can uh, be consistent enough to give the the Flames the depth that they need to be uh, successful cons- uh, uh, on in a day in day out game in game out uh, consistent basis. Yeah, they need to be a lot. They need to be consistent this year for sure. That it, 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 the expected third line being Jankowski, Bennett, and Froelich needs to be consistent this year. I mean, the fourth line is going to be a hodgepodge of different people that I think we'll see a number of different people there throughout the season. But I think that third line and that secondary scoring needs to be important if the Flames are going to be a playoff playoff team this year. I think is going to be huge. And I think we need to figure out, the, especially the backup goalie, because. I don't think we're going to expect Smith to play 50 or 60. I think 50 games for Mike Smith. If we get 50 games from him, I'll be very happy. But we need someone for 30, the 32 others that I think is going to at least provide some some solid goaltending. Yeah, that, and that that comes down to uh, the, uh, the 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 Flames uh, prospects coming pushing for that spot. The uh, the Mason McDonald's, the and uh, and all that that definitely definitely need to step up and push David Riddich to and push him aside because as quirky and and fun a guy as Riddich is to follow, I I don't see him being that uh, twenty to thirty game starter that you would you need if you've got Mike Smith as your starter. Yeah. And Gillies, and yeah, someone has to step up in that thing. And I, I don't think that they needed to get a veteran. I think it was, I think, I think the way that Tree Lehman handled this, putting this on the pressure on the, on the younger guys, I think is smart. Uh, it's time, it's time for them to take that step. Uh, especially Gillies' contract, it's two way this year, one way next year. So there is starting to get some expectations, which I think is good. But again. Be very interested to see how this training camp goes, and if, if this team is different, it's going to be yeah. very interesting. Wow. And different in, in, in like an attitude, uh, different in, in everything else, because you can't be, yeah, you're going to throw these people under the bus. If you're going to throw Dougie Hamilton under the bus, which it's, you know, you can say that the Flames legitimately threw Dougie Hamilton under the bus. I don't think that you can disagree, necessarily say that he hasn't. I mean, he was part of the whipping boy of this dressing room problem. If you're going to throw Dougie Hamilton's and Troy Browers under the bus, you better produce. Yeah, it's, it's, it's time. Yeah, this. And that's sort of, I think, why they brought in a, a, a Peters, because he's uh, supposed to be the uh, the hard nosed guy. The, 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 they overcorrected from Hartley to. Gulletson, and now they're trying to go back to that hard nose uh, style. So, yeah, 
going to be very interesting as that in that land as well. Uh, next time we meet, we'll rant about the Oilers a little bit more. Well, maybe maybe we'll get into that a little bit later. But there was some other stuff that happened this uh, in the NHL. Uh, the biggest story I think is from today. Nate Schmidt has been suspended twenty games by the National Hockey League. I'm going to read the statement from him and then going to see how Sean feels and how you all feel as well. I am extremely disappointed to learn that I have been suspended for a violation of the NHL NHLPA performance enhancing substance program. The fact that I'm issuing this statement is surreal to me as I've only used supplements provided by my NHL team and I've always been extremely careful about what I put into my body. Throughout my playing career, I have tested numerous times, including twice last season, and I have never before tested positive. It was utterly shocking to be informed that I tested positive for a microscopic amount of a tainted substance. Not only did I not take, intentionally take a banned substance, I could not have received any performance enhancement benefit from the trace amount that inadvertently got into my system at a level that was far too small to have any effect. The low amount was consistent with the environmental contamination that I could not have possibly have prevented. And I'll just finish this last part here. One of the experts is in environmental contamination who has testified on my behalf at the appeal hearing, described the amount of the substance found in my system, seventh billionth of a milligram as the... Uh, oh, Seventh million, basically, let's, yeah, let's just basically leave it there. So, and then he goes on to say, basically, he, I'll read the end here. I've worked my whole life to become an NHL player. I'm extremely pr proud to be a player in the NHL. I have never cut corners in order to achieve this goal. I am grateful for the support of the entire Vegas Golden Knights organization, and I can't put in the words how disappointed I am. I will not be on the ice at the beginning of the season to help my teammates work towards an, another Stanley Cup run. What are your thoughts on this? What did you think? Big deal, no big deal? Sounds to me like uh, there was a, it was a, a supplement uh, mix-up, um, which sucks because if that's the case, then he definitely didn't mean to do it. Uh, uh, in, he didn't mean to do to ingest it uh, intentionally, but uh, unfortunately, just that's the the uh the environment we're we're in with professional sports and and drugs and doping um you re, uh, uh, players uh athletes need to really be on top of their nutrition and supplements more than anyone else and if and unfortunately he just got uh, caught in a bad situation it looks like but you never know with these uh until the whole story comes out so uh, it's just, it's just, uh, I like the way, I like the stringency on it because you don't want pe people and players to try and, and cheat the system, but, uh, it just sucks for Nate Schmidt if, uh, he indeed is, uh, just, uh, what sounds like a, a mix up in, in supplements and something that was labeled one for one thing is probably, was probably something different. What do you? What did you think of the reaction towards Nate Schmidt? Because some people are behind him, but some have felt like he is didn't like this statement. I I think those people who are sort of against him um, are just uh, cynical towards athletes when it comes to um, using drugs and, and doping and performance enhancing. Uh, and unfortunately, they they have a right to be just based off of. Uh, starting with baseball and the Olympics and all that. But uh, like I said, it's, it's, for me, it's just tough to really come to a, a real def definite conclusion until I, until I hear the whole story. But just from his statement and all that, I think there is a good chance that it was uh, just one of the supplements he took was, wasn't quite made to its standard or was mislabeled or, or something along those lines that just uh, contaminated uh, it and he just he got stuck in a, in a bad situation. 
Yeah, I and I mean, I think there's there's more to be told to this story. I think I'm sure at some point the Vegas Golden Knights also issued a statement regarding the suspension. I'll just read that. Uh, we were notified that the NHL has suspended Nate Schmidt for violating the terms of the NHL NHLPA Performance Enhanced Substance Program. While we respect the NHL NHLPA Performance Enhancing Substance Program and are committed to its success, we strongly disagree with the suspension. We firmly believe that the presence of a trace of the banned substance was accidental and unintentional. Based on our conversation with Nate, analysis from the independent medical experts, and sworn testimony from the parties involved, we believe that it is clear that Nate was not able to reasonably ascertain how the substance entered his body. Nate is an honest person with high moral character and great integrity. We will stand by him and support him during this time. The Golden Knights will not be commenting further on the matter. So basically, they are fine. This is a suspension, but we're going to stand behind our player. And as they, I think that's a great way of, uh, for them to, like, that's the, the stance that they should be taking because and if they feel that he was, and from what uh, everything you're, we're hearing at this point, because we haven't heard other than they suspended Nitschmidt, we haven't heard from the other side. Um, I don't know what else they could they could do to, to uh, stand up for their player, show that they they want him, they 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 believe him. So until the proof comes out otherwise that he did he did mean to ingest it, and then there's only so much they can do. It's not like it's a uh, something a little more delicate, like uh, something to do with the, with the law or anything like that. So at this point, it's uh, innocent until proven guilty in terms of uh, whether or not he did it purposely. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think there's not much more to say other than that this was a story that I think we'll see what happens this week about it. But it, this isn't something that we see a lot in hockey anyway. Um, and yeah, this next time we gather, I'm sure there'll be more on that. Other news that happened this week uh, is Max Pacioretty went to, had a golf tournament in Montreal, and he had an awkward moment meeting his general manager, who has yet to trade him. Uh, you know, as much as Ottawa is getting all this flack for how bad that this organization has run, while Mon- the legendary. Over 20 Stanley Cups, Montreal Canadiens feel a lot like the Cleveland Browns sometimes, don't they? Yeah, it's uh, it if it wasn't for the fact that Ottawa has been such an absolute mess this off season, the headlines would be definitely a lot harsher on uh, Montreal, especially with the way that they're handling uh, this Pacioretty. Uh, situation after uh, the last two off seasons where where they saw them trade away PK Subban and uh, then uh, making a trade uh, to try and bring in that uh, number one center in Jonathan Duran, but it looking that's bad now looking like it's backfiring with Sergeyev playing so well in in Tampa, so it's really tough to to to, to have a uh, bright side outlook on what's going on in Montreal. Yeah. And it's just like, it's, I mean, it's such a weird and awkward situation. Um, there was supposed to be a deal on the table at the draft at to LA that didn't happen. Uh, this thing, I mean, and this off season for Montreal, it's like, I'm sorry, Sean, but there's a really good chance that the Montreal Canadiens might have a better shot at Jack Hughes than the Canucks. Uh, look at this. Uh, this, I mean, the defense for this team, Carl Alsner, Jordy Ben, Noah Jusen, Victor Meta, Xavier Olet, J- Jeff Petrie, Michael Moravich, Mike Riley, David Schmecklo, David Solinka, and... Out for six months, Shea Weber. Does that create any excitement? This is a team that had Mikhail Sergachev and P.K. Subban at one point in time. Yeah, it's it's uh, <laughs> the, old, the old, there's there, there's only one one reason to be 
to say that that doesn't matter, and that's Carey Price. If Carey Price is on his game, that average to sub-average defense core um, until Shea Weber gets back and then slightly above average defense core as long as he's playing the way he can doesn't isn't isn't going to be isn't going to hurt him as much as it would other teams because they've got uh carry price if he's on his game and that's going to be the big one of the big questions in montreal montreal for the training camp where he's at um and maybe even where he's at mentally with this organization at this point i mean it's it seems exasperating I, it's it's beyond me that that Mr. Bergevin is still employed by the Montreal Canadiens in this capacity because I, I you cannot be based on the trades that this guy has done Subban for Weber and, and no offense to Weber it's it, I mean it just was a terrible trade but Duran for Sergachev uh, Domi for Galchenyuk you you can't be confident that you're going to get a heck of a lot for Max Pacioretty. Yeah, well, it's it just seems that uh, for all the all the flack that Benning gets in Vancouver for sort of pinpointing a player and getting him and having to pay a little bit extra to get him, uh, Bergevin just seems to be gambling on these one for one trades and isn't coming out uh, looking looking good on. Two out of, two of them right now, and I think the the, the betting are, odds are that uh, the uh, Galchenyuk Domi trade will won't uh, shine uh, bright on and look good on on Bergevin at the end either. So yeah, it's definitely tough if you're a, if you're a Habs fan uh, and knowing that uh, there is a good chance that Pacioretty will be traded, that uh, the return will be uh, acceptable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it does Pacioretty get is Pacioretty at camp at the start of training camp for the Canadians? Yes, he's he's one of those guys. He's the captain. He loves Montreal as a city. I think he just is uh, just like uh, Eric Carlson in Ottawa. Just is fed up with uh, how the uh, organization's being run and how he's being treated by them. There is Eric Carlson, an Ottawa Senator at training camp. Uh, yes, I think there. For what, what, whatever you want to say about Dorian and and the whole Ottawa Senators, just debacle that's happened this off season. He's, I think he'll he'll play he'll try and take the Joe Sackick approach with Carlson and slow play it until the deadline and then um, make the best trade possible unless someone comes up and uh, is able to knock their socks off because there's def- I, there's definitely probably some handcuffs on Dorian with uh, Eugene Melnick wanting to ship off um, – Bobby Ryan and his contract with the uh, Eric Carlson deal. Yeah, and really, it's looking the situation is 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 there are maybe three teams involved. We believe Vegas is involved. We believe Dallas involved, and we some are still saying Tampa is involved. Depending on who you hear, uh, it's going to take a lot to get him out of there, and. You know, right now, maybe this is me, but if I'm looking at Eric at the situation with Eric Carlson, he was hurt for most of last season. Kind of want to see what he's coming back as. And especially a team like Vegas, I'm get, I know that you got to the Stanley Cup final last year, but and you got a big cupboard. You got a lot of stuff that you can give, but do you really want to give this to, for an Eric Carlson? Like, do you really, 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 like, if you're not sure that this guy's going to play for the next four or five years, it, because the chances are, are this is a rental in one way, shape, or another. Like, even if you are assuming he's not going to a Canadian team, and he's probably not going to a Canadian team at this point, not in a trade anyway, although I'm going to throw a theory out you in a second. Uh, 
it's pretty risky. It's a pretty risky acquisition in a lot of ways, isn't it? Like it's not, I don't know if I'd be like, I mean, it sounds salivating in one sense, but I can see why there's caution in another. Well, yeah, he's had a couple major injuries in the past last past uh, couple seasons. And you definitely want to see where he's at come next year, but he was looking good at the end of last season. Uh, and you would, and he's got enough skill and smarts to be able to continue to be a, at the very least a top top pair defenseman. He may never be the 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 best defenseman in the league by a wide gap as he was for a couple seasons there, but he's still going to be well worth the the at least the money that will be shelled out to sign him. Uh, the assets that will be required to to get him in a trade, that's another question. Um, but if you're Tampa where you're in a win now mode, I don't think it's too big of a, a stretch to say that uh, giving up a few future assets that are, they're already pretty deep. They may not have a super exciting uh, prospect pool, but they got a deep prospect pool. I, I don't, I wouldn't question it in the very least if uh, they they seem to find a way to make that move. Uh, Dallas needs to be to switch to win now mode as well, as well as um, uh, and Vegas is Vegas is different just because they caught lightning in a bottle this past season, and I don't see them being anywhere near near as good as they were uh, in this upcoming season. So. If they want to, but if they want to continue to to build that fan base and build the excitement around them, then adding a player like Eric Carlson may not work in terms of hockey, just asset wise. But in terms of business wise, it, in the long term, it's probably a, a good move to make. I'm going to throw another team in here that I've been thinking about, and they won't do it because they have been traditionally conservative and I understand why they have been conservative, but I'm going to hear me out here. The whole debate in, in Raptor land this off season has been about the Kawhi Leonard mood is, is you got to put on your air quotes here, big boy pants. And if you want to win, you got to make this kind of deal. Maybe he signs, maybe he does not Maybe, you know, Maybe, who knows, but there's a real big opportunity to get a top five player in Raptor land, and he may stay, he may not, whatever. This is, that's, it's a bit of a gamble, and you got to do it. What if you're the Winnipeg Jets? You were one series away from getting to the Stanley Cup final. You have the prospects to make this move. You're not, even if you keep Eric Carlson for one year, you are not necessarily hurt by this loss. If you're Winnipeg, do you not at least take a longer look and say, okay, I'll take this risk of, of the one year. And you know what? It may be an environment that he may want to stay in. If there is one Canadian team that I could see getting involved in this, it is the Winnipeg Jets because they do have the capital to debate the move that it doesn't necessarily hurt them. It could, it could benefit them to get to that next level. If the GM was anyone other than Kevin Shelwoodayoff, and as you said, his tendency to be very conservative, I would say, yeah, that they would. I wouldn't be surprised to see them in there. But uh, they're just they're they're not necessarily a big budget team either. So it's it'd be tough to. I think still going the if the if. Carlson gets to next trade deadline uh, as an Ottawa senator, then I would say Winnipeg is is someone you look at, a team that you look at as a as an, a, a dark horse to come in, sweep in, and and get him. Uh, but I think they're they already have a very deep uh, defense with Bufflin, Truba, Tyler Myers, and Josh Morrissey. I, like yeah, adding Carlson does improve that, but 
it's again one of these uh, t- like just tough uh, decisions to make for right now because you could you can make an argument that with uh, just some improvements from within, they're they're a cup contender. So why give up those assets now when you have a you've proven why in in uh, when in a conservative mind with uh, with how Shovel Day Off has gone gone about it? I just don't see it happening until they until the the deadline if they feel that they need to make that that big move. Yeah. The other issue is is long term. They've got. Truba's looking for a new contract at the end of next year. Tyler Myers is looking for a new contract at the end of next year. And then uh, you're, you're look, you, they still have to sign uh, Josh Morrissey to, to a contract for this year. So they still have a lot in the cap that they have to, to account for, even though they're not necessarily close to it at this point. That's, that, yeah, that's true. It's just, it, yeah, I, I feel like... I feel like the the problem at Winnipeg is going to run into at some point in time. Like, like they they're great, but it's they. I think what's going to hold them back is, is there's got to be a point where they got to make. I don't know if they have to make the biggest trade, but they do may need to make that splash. And I think I don't. I think it's curious that Paul Snazny left. Winnipeg and jump to Vegas. I'm curious about that. I mean, I, it, it's, it's that that's an interesting thing. Be, that, like, I mean, they were still good without Paul Stashney. They're still going to be good without Paul Stashney. It's not a huge loss. But if, I'm wondering at some point if this conservative mindset of Winnipeg is going to hold them back a little bit. Oh, I think you can make the argument that it already has. But... I think it's just something that they're going to stick to. They're starting to see the results. They've got uh, Josh Morrissey stepping up big time that this past year and becoming that top four defenseman that they, they've they drafted him to be. Uh, they've got uh, Logan Stanley coming up through the, the ranks and on the blue line. They've got uh, up front with the reason they probably had they didn't uh, feel the need to push Paul Stasny to stay so much too much is that they've got Kyle Connor, Jack Roslovich, both uh, who came in and uh, played really well as rookies last year that they're still developing into, into players. And as I said, just going forward, they need to make sure that they've, they're, they're more of a budget team than a cap team anyway. So they still got to find the, the money for, as I said, Jacob Truba, uh, whether or not they decide to keep Tyler Myers, they've got to sign Josh Morrissey to a contract this year. Next year, Patrick Line is going to be needing a new contract, so that's going to be a big money ticket. It's going to be uh, if, and that's why I'm saying if uh, if it comes comes down to the deadline and Eric Carlson's still there, I, I wouldn't put it past the uh, put it past shovel day off to to make that big move then, but uh, it's going to. He's not going to pull the trigger until until the deadline. Yeah, yeah, I I, I can see that, but I'm I'm just putting Winnipeg in that mix just because I yeah I, I like that as a dark horse. As I said, if it if uh, Carlson's still a senator come the deadline. Yeah, uh, the other team that has been before we get to our final one here, uh, the other team that has been linked to Eric Carlson sort of is the Edmonton Oilers. And, you know, I, I they probably have had a – I don't think that they have had a really great offseason, quite frankly. I, I really don't know what they're doing there. I don't know how Kyle Brodziak solves any problems on this, this team. They still haven't signed Darnell Nurse, and there are rumors he's not coming to camp. Uh, the others are, are another quiet little mess, aren't they? It's – like the drafting Evan Bouchard was was good for them, but he yeah. sort of fell into their lap. Um, but yeah, it's tough. There saw saw some uh, some rumors, some headlines that the they're still trying to move Milan Lucic and his contract, but they're going to have to add uh, 
add something quite uh, quite attractive for uh, teams to bite on that. And it's just just seems like more of the same with uh, Chiarelli and in, in, in Edmonton, where they've got arguably arguably the best uh, uh, player, if not not arguably the best, and he is the best player in in the world in Connor McDavid. But they've continually gotten slower around him, and he's one of the, one of the best skaters out there. So it's it, it continue, yeah. I'm not too sure what they're trying to do. You, every every one outside of the Oilers keeps saying they need to get faster, but they continue to add uh, add these guys who aren't necessarily speed. Is the and just going forward, it, in, unless they change change direction and start consciously adding that, I don't I don't see them breaking out of this little uh, after the breaking through to the playoffs two seasons ago. I don't see them doing much more than what they did this past year. Yeah. Yeah. And to, to have a guy like Connor McDavid and waste this talent, although he's very young, it's just, it's bizarre to me. Uh, But we'll, we'll talk about the Oilers more on another podcast. I want to end this with talking about a guy uh, that he is very polarizing and he made a polarizing, uh, some polarizing comments this week. Let's see if we can hear from what Tyler Sagan had to say. He said, Oh. towards contention. Sagan is eager to make a long-term commitment to the franchise and is surprised a deal hasn't gotten done this summer. Nothing's really going on. Uh, you know, pretty much haven't been talking much this summer. It's been it's been a little disappointing. You know, I thought I'd have, uh, you know, some excitement, exciting news to talk about at Valsey Camp, especially this late in the summer. But, um, no, it's been disappointing. But at the end of the day, you know, I've always had one year left here. You know, some focus on that. Just to be clear, you said that. That is Tyler Sagan expressing his disappointment a few days ago about his contract negotiation with the Dallas Stars. He is set to become an unrestricted free agent next season. Uh, man, that US, that unrestricted free agent pool, will, in terms of talent, is very fascinating. And Tyler Sagan, we're not going to argue about this man's talent. Absolutely one of the most talented players in the league. However, he is also one of the most enigmatic. Igna- is that the word I'm looking for? Enigmatic players in the league. He's had history of the Bruins traded him because of, of this enigmaticism. And the Dallas Stars may be a resistant because of this as well. Uh, whose side are you on here? Are you on Sagan's or the Stars? Because I kind of understand what the Dallas Stars are doing here. I don't... I don't know if I want to offer this guy a long-term contract. I want to see what this guy is going to bring this season under a new coach in Jim Montgomery. I think that's definitely part of it. I think the other part of it is going back to the Carlson talks. They've been they've been mentioned a bit. You kind of want to see if Carlson comes over if they can if they can make, get that done uh, before you uh, start committing uh, long-term big money to to Tyler Sagan. Because if Carlson doesn't come over, then do you do you go full bore into uh, win now mode, or do you uh, try and uh, do a bit of a retool uh, and and uh, move on from a, a Tyler Sagan and uh, try and and build more around the future with the uh, like a like a Miro, a Miro Heiskanen that they drafted last year? So it's it's going to be. But uh, the other thing is, yeah. Tyler Sagan, as uh, enigmatic as he, as he can be, is still one of the most talented players in the league. And and when you look at uh, top franchise level players, that uh, he's in that level. Contract uh, negotiations usually start by now, and if they haven't, then he has every right to be a little uh, little miffed. Yeah, it's he's such a interesting. He's such an interesting talent because, I mean, it's hard not to love what this guy is on the ice. He's an interesting guy off the ice. I guess, you know, maybe the Canadian in all of us is like, uh, he's a bit too out there. But maybe in the other side of it is maybe we need a few more out there. It's, it's, I mean, I don't know Tyler Sagan personally. I mean, everything that I have heard has been rumors and conjecture or whatever, and I can't confirm or deny that. Um, he's a different car- cat. Um, and you're right, I do. you didn't, you got up the Carlson part, that's a really good point. 
there too. Uh, do you see this? So you see this guy in next season? Is he uh, like in terms of a like top level Tavares? People are going to be we're going to have presentations for Tyler Sagan. Are we seeing that, or what are we seeing with Tyler Sagan? Oh yeah, he's he's on that level. Like if he makes it to unrestricted free agency, he is that. He will be the big story. And guess what? He's from Ontario again. So, <laughs> despite, <laughs> despite the despite the fact that uh, Toronto may not be, depending on what they decide to do and move on, who knows? Toronto media love to love to bring their their uh, their Ontario boys home. So, um, but uh, yeah, if he does make it to to unrestricted free agency, he will be the next the next guy that you will see the Darren Draggers and the the everyone else that will follow to uh, stand outside the, his uh, his agent's office and try and get the the news that will never come. Gosh, I'm already imagining this. Oh my gosh, and just like oh, oh man, <laughs> yeah, like oh, oh man. Well, I mean, hey, it happened with Tavares. Who knows if it could be? Say say again. I, but I get, you know what, if you're the lead, I understand why, okay, from a tier talent perspective, okay, I get it, why you, why you want Sagan for sure, I get that, but um, at the same time, what are you saying about Matthews, like, oh, I guess you got Tavares and Sagan, Matthews and Marner, I mean, they're going to be planning seven parades, I guess. Uh, it's not, it's not going to happen, but... You know. That's not going to stop the, uh, <laughs> the the Toronto media from uh, imagining things, but I think the fact that they got their boy Tavares this year will will will, will hinder that a lot, especially because they they do need to they still have to sign Nylander and and Marner's coming up next year as well as Matthews. But no, I <laughs> but uh, getting back to say to say again, you look at that that. Uh, that uh, free agency pool next year, it's it could like it's not it could be pretty um, pretty uh, extraordinary. Just with uh, you've got Mark Stone is going to be um, available. Like, what does he sign long term in Ottawa? You've got Eric Carlson potentially, Matt Duchesne. There you go. Ottawa losing three of their their top three players potentially next year. Artemi Panarin has, has uh, shown that he's not necessarily wanting to stay long term in Columbus. Tyler Sagan, yeah, it's going to be very interesting. Wow, <laughs> next yeah. summer with uh, if uh, even half those players make it. Yeah, it'll it's going to yeah. It, and I'm kind of not gonna lie, I would love to see kind of an insane NHL free agency where it's just like all of them go out, but who. Like that, we don't typically see that. But, um, well, I think next year is just a little more interesting because you're usually going into into one. You're like, you look at you look at the it's like, oh, look at all these big names. But then you, you when you rationally go through it, they're like he'll resign, he'll resign, he'll resign. So coming up to this this past summer, you knew that Tavares was going to test, especially after Stamkos did his the last year. And then you look at, but you look at next year and name it if just the, the three Ottawa guys alone, you don't know if they're going to stay long, if they're going to want to stay long term. So whether or not they get traded and signed by the new by the new team, or they, um, or they just go hit hit free agency right off the bat, and then you, you've got Tyler Sagan just bemoaning his contract situation. You've got um, Artemi Panarin, who's 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 looked at who's who is all intents and purposes looking for a way out of Columbus. It could be a real, real interesting yeah summer next year. Well, that and could lead to a really interesting trade deadline too, because if these guys don't sign, uh, yeah, that, you know, and, and then I, back to Pacioretty too. He's a he's a free agent next year too. Yeah. Yeah, and also I think um, they are already planning for next podcast. I think coaches on the hot seat. I think there's going to be – last year we did not have a single coach fired during the season. 
I do not think we go through that this year. I, I think I think the first Biden uh, North American Thanksgiving or North American Thanksgiving, we could see possibly two, maybe three, if they do not get off to a good start. Coaching changes. Uh, I think well, yeah, you've the- got Montreal, Ottawa, and Edmonton. Yeah, in terms of the Canadian teams, um, and then. I'm not too sure, and anyone else is no one else is coming to my to the forefront for me, just because there has been a decent amount of of change um, it, it, in the off season, uh, even though we didn't see any any changes during the season. John Tortorella, watch out! I if Columbus does not get off, they, there there is an expiry date on this guy. You know this, that there's an expiry date on John Tortorella. <laughs> yes, you know this. There is. <laughs> and I, I, I mean. I just don't see that happening because I just, I like I like what Columbus has despite the Panarin is, issues they've got. They've got uh, such a good blue line. They've got two of the best anchoring it and, and youngest younger guys too in Seth Jones and Zach Arensky, so. And then they've still got Bobrovsky in that too. So I just don't see that happening. Yeah, I, I mean maybe maybe the like maybe this is the last year of Tortorella, but I mean I don't know he 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 has a shelf life. I'm just that's all I'm saying. Uh, also, I think the other thing is the other one that I think is going to be very he's not leaving during the season. I would think not, but Joel Quinville. I think last year becoming a story that, I mean, they were thinking of it. I wonder what his lifeline is in Chicago this year. And by God, the Blackhawks, if the Blackhawks get rid of Joel Quinville, that is one of the dumbest moves in the history of hockey. I will grant you that. I think he is in the top five of modern era coaches for sure. It's hard to argue against that. Uh, but I wonder if Joel Quinville feel, will feel that his time is up in Chicago and it's time for him to go to another another land. I think that's definitely more of a – that's definitely an option for sure. Uh, I think just the time is up for Chicago period, the, the, the current core of Chicago period, whether or not that's the coach or is yeah. up for debate, but uh, I don't think it is. I think it's just that, that core. It's just like uh, the – the Canucks a few years back. It wasn't Elaine Vigno that was the issue. It was just the the stale core. Yeah. And the problem with uh, with most uh, NHL teams is they're very conservative and very much hold, hold on to their their players too long. Unlike the unlike um, it is in the NFL, where yeah. it is as soon as there's any sort of degressing of uh, of results, they they find a way to move on and, and uh, rebuild. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And yeah, it's, yeah. So very interesting. It's getting back to hockey, back to everything, back to hockey. Um, I, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be reconvening. Probably it's going to be a weekend podcast for the hockey podcast, just because I have other stuff going on during the week, but I think probably we'll be attempting for having, like a Saturdays maybe is kind of my idea, but who knows how, what happens if there's big stuff, we will always come back and chat about it. Uh, where do we find you, Sean? I'm on Twitter at Beardy Connect zero three. All right. And yes, follow me K V O L E on Twitter as well. Like the hockey podcast. You can follow podcast hockey on Twitter as well, but speaker.com K V O L E for all of your podcasts by me, Sean. Thanks for joining Longer podcast than usual. Well, no, actually, it's in her average time, an hour and 15 minutes. We will talk to everyone very soon. Bye for now.